Jim Ha, for those of you who don't know, at University of Washington at, uh, at Seattle, um, and been involved behind the scenes with Sparks for many, many years, um, working with Prescott to sort of develop the program, and uh, so I'm excited to be here this year and actually get to be here in, in person. Nathan, um, I wanted to sort of explore a little bit for a few minutes here. Um, sort of the, 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 the joy of science. I mean, you, collect, you showed us lots of great data, beautiful presentation. Thank you. Um, but sort of get at sort of the marvel of it. And so, um, so for instance, what surprised you the most? Well, um, so going back to when I first started graduate school, as I said, you know, I, I, I took my dog and I was like, I'm just gonna point her to the right smell and now I have my detection dog, now I can start my research. And that didn't work. Um, Essentially, the entire sort of first year and a half was really just figuring out what's going on. Uh, and I'm a tinkerer, so I'm the, kind of, I'm the kind of person that will take, you know, things apart and try and see how they work together. And that's really what I had to do to sort of figure out what was going on here. Um, the, the, the procedure that we, we developed sort of with the, with the buckets of pine shaving, that sort of didn't come out of nowhere. That, that came out of a lot of tinkering. So we tried other substrates. So we tried dirt, but dirt was kind of messy. We tried um, uh, the little newspaper sort of kitty litter as a good substance, but turns out because they absorb so much moisture, the dog's nose is wet, right? So when the dog sticks its nose in to smell it, it picks up this kitty litter, then it chomps on it, and then that's a disaster. Um, we try like corn husker cop. I mean, so m my entire sort of exploration has always been let's try this, see how that works. Let's try that, see how that works. I think I think it yeah. surprises a lot of non-scientists right. sometimes how much trial and error right. goes into it, and 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 sort of serendipity, just being at the right place at the right time, right. you know, and you try this or that, and, right. and and it works. I wanted to ask you a question uh, um, about the test, about the the buckets and. Mm -hmm. And, and it seems to me, and I'm not a dog detection person, but a lot of times the response that's asked for is more just of a nose touch or something like that. And you had a little bit more involved of a task there where they were actually searching in the pine shavings. And was there a reason for that? So we, uh, so we picked a, a digging task, um, partially because I was also reading some papers where they had similar things with rodents, and the rodents make a really nice dig. Um, and the dogs, I, I played around with the dogs, and they have a, a nice sort of rooting response for food. Uh, so we were trying to capture uh, a biologically prepared response that we could sort of reinforce very quickly. I didn't, so um, one of the standards is like a, a nice sit alert, right? Yeah. Um, we didn't want to work with that because we're going to have different dogs of different histories for sitting. So we might have some dogs who have no idea how to sit or some dogs that are perfectly good at sitting. Um, so we would have that variability in the pet population. And also, um, if you, if you, to get to some of this research where you have to train for several days um, and then also evaluate different conditions on top of that using pet dogs, it starts to get very long. So we wanted to pick something that we could capture that was sort of already right. prepared in a sense very quickly. So training the alert response, we typically take about eight trials or about a couple of minutes, and then we move on right. to discrimination training. Right. Right. And, and you sort of bring up another point that, that I was sort of thinking about. What, what dogs did you use? Did you describe what population of dogs? Were these sort of standardized breed, or were you using you know, pet, pet dogs? Or? So it depends on the study. So they were all pet dogs um, for all of these. For uh, when we made group comparisons, we, we, we tried to counterbalance for breed, depending on that. Uh, but then this, uh, more of the study that I presented on here, we went more of a within subject design. So uh, everyone was being compared to themselves in a sense and not to some group mean. Uh, so for there, we, we took uh, any dogs that we could get. Uh, I'm not particularly breed biased in any of those, in those <laughs> factors. So do you, do, you, do you think, or are you concerned, or do you think that added introduced a lot of variability I I into your results? And, and so how do you sort of think about that issue if you think it is an issue? Right, so in terms of uh, the group designs, I think that it, it, you have to really be careful about, about selecting what breeds you're going to have for that type, uh, for, for that component. Um, we actually did a, another study with breeds in itself where we compared pugs and German shepherds, uh, and that in itself indicated that if you were to set up a, you know, two conditions between that, you'll see differences right then and there. Yeah. Um, so what we tried to have moved to is a sort of within-subject design so that 
really you're just comparing to themselves. And as we talked, uh, as Jean Brewer talked about earlier, this sort of potential uh, sensitivity treatment effect, um, where you really have to start uh, sort of considering uh, those types of factors. Uh, so we were sort of relying on the assumption that our treatment effect would be at least be in the same direction right. Right. for each dog. Right. So that like Pavlovian condition would not have the opposite effect, but it may have less of a sensitivity effect depending on either the breed or even the dog's history yeah. of, of different sort of odor exposures. Yeah. So it's definitely something that needs to start being accounted for. And even looking at in the data, um, I try to make sure that I look at each individual dog's performance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's certainly an issue. It's one that I've been exposed to in my research where I'm working mostly with you know, pet dogs and not a standardized population, right. things like that. And, and another facet to that, of course, is, is sort of the argument that, sure, that kind of thing, the history, the breed, the genetics, mm -hmm. can all introduce variability. And it really becomes, it's not so important if you actually see an effect, right? right? You know, if your effect is so great that it sort of punches through that. Right, right. Right, right That's exactly. actually a pretty good effect. Right. I mean, you know, yeah. that, that, that does, none of that matters. If you, the problem is if you don't see it or it's a very small effect, then it may get swallowed up sort of in the Very quickly the by noise, that variability. The variability, but your design, right. your second design with the, the matching and so on is, is, a very, is a very sophisticated way of dealing with that. So that's, that's great. Um, you uh, mentioned backstage that you have a postdoc, you have a little additional funding. So where, where are you going with this? What are you going to do new next? So we're, we're continuing to do um, olfactory discrimination work. Um, so we're interested in trying to, um, well, some of the work that we've also been working on right now is bringing uh, more control over the, the odor source. So. Uh, I really like this procedure with, where we have the two buckets in terms of its quickness and easiness, but it prevents us from addressing questions of sensitivity of the dog's nose. You can dilute it, but unfortunately with odors, they sort of just, they disappear on you, right? They're volatile. They don't sit in any particular thing like a solid would, or because if they did, then they're not odors, right? So um, we're, we're developing sort of more automated type of things that can present more controlled stimuli to the dogs, and we're going to be looking at um, how can we present sort of more complex stimuli? Because we typically talk about, this is my target odor, this is my one odor. But that one odor is probably made up of about three, 400 different chemical you know, components. Um, and a lot of times we talk about, well, the dogs can, uh, can perceive each individual component. Um, and, and we don't know. And for the most part, if we were to know from the human literature, right, you start mixing more than four different chemicals together, you can no longer pick out what the individual components are. So can the dog? So we're going to start looking at how, what happens when you start mixing different components together, how does that influence the perception, and can the dogs sort of look at odors analytically in a sense in terms of the components compared to sort of these complex mixtures, which is what we see in everyday life, you know, a flower, right? That's not, a, that's not an odor, uh, well, it's an odor, but it's not one chemical component in itself. It's a mixture of three, 400 different components. So if you had sort of one message, you know, in a more general sense, not maybe not even necessarily odor or not necessarily detection dogs, but, mm -hmm. you know, we have a lot of folks who are doing a lot of dog training out there in general. Do you have sort of a take-home message or a suggestion even or that, um, that, that you might want to pass along? Well, in, well, for odor detection, uh, I can't talk enough about Pavlovian conditioning. I love it. Um, but in the more general sense for working with dogs outside of that is uh, there's so much that can be done uh, in terms of don't stop exploring in a sense. Because it, if you find something interesting, stop there and, and figure out what's going on. Uh, and, and try to reduce it analytically. And you don't need 100 dogs or 1,000 dogs. Uh, sometimes we get lost in that we have to find everything as it has to work at you know, 500 dogs. But sometimes you can manipulate things and do really interesting experiments with a single dog and see how some particular things influence this particular dog's behavior and start to manipulate different variables and experiment with that. And you can, put it, you can learn a lot from that way. I, I have a feeling then your dog uh, yeah, <laughs> was my, subject to, yeah. Okay, my dog has played you, in everything. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. A wonderful presentation. Thank you, everybody.